Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, begin turning to Galatians chapter 3. As we've been going through Galatians, Galatians chapter 1 and 2, we were reading how Paul was making this case and kind of laying out before the church of Galatia that they had distorted the gospel and that they were entertaining distortions of the gospel. And now in chapters 3 and 4, Paul's going to be laying out this idea that, you know, what is our faith? What is the gospel? How do we receive the gospel? How do we experience the gospel? And then in chapters 5 and 6, we'll see how the, the gospel impacts how we live after we've given our life to Christ. And so with that in mind, as you're turning to Galatians chapter 3, the question I want us to start with is, why do we do what we do? Have you ever really thought about that before and really considered why we do what we do? And I know yesterday was a big day in college football. Tennessee beat the Gators. I had to say it, right? We had to mention something, right? And so I imagine tomorrow on every sports radio station, it's going to be Tennessee should be number one in the nation, period, right? That, but you look at like, okay, look at what they did at the stadium. When they pan these stadiums, you look at people dressed up. You see people face painted. You see people yelling and screaming. Have you ever wondered and asked, why do we do that? Have you asked, like, well, why do, we, why do we come here and sing as believers? Why do we sing? Why do we read the Bible? Why do we do what we do? Why do we go to Walmart? Why do we go here and there? Why do we, why do, we do what we do? See, a lot of times I think what happens is we get going through the motions of life, and we don't take a moment to step back and really consider why. See, when we don't really consider why, when it comes to our spiritual lives, what happens is we get caught in, in these going through the motions of life, and we begin to distort the gospel like the people in Galatia were doing. They lost sight of why they were coming together to worship, why they were redeemed. And so Galatians 3 and 4, we're looking at why we're redeemed, how we're redeemed. And we need to remember why and how. These things are important. So with that in mind, Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. Because it is written, everyone who does not do everything written in the book of the law is cursed. Now it is clear that no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. Faith is how we live. Faith is how we come to Christ and then faith is how we respond to Christ. So Paul is going to be kind of driving this point home in these next couple of chapters, this idea of that, hey, our goodness, our acts of goodness accomplish nothing before a holy God. We don't come to him offering things and, and buying redemption or earning redemption, earning our salvation. We come to him empty-handed by faith. Trusting in the gospel. See, we can never live up to this measure here. It says if faith came by the law, then what good was Christ? And here you see if the law commands even to be, perf to be perfect. To follow the law perfectly. Dude, this is a quotation here when it says, Everyone who does, does not do everything written in the book of the law is cursed comes from Deuteronomy 27, 26. Anyone who does not put the words of this law into practice is cursed. And all the people will say, Amen. See, the problem with the standard of perfection is that we can never achieve that. As it says in Isaiah 64, 6, all of us have become something unclean and our righteous acts are like polluted garments. All of us wither like a leaf and our iniquities carry us away like the wind. See, one of the great lies of our culture today is that somehow man can be good apart from God. 
That somehow we are born innocent or we have some sort of innocence within us or some sort of purity or goodness that is just naturally a part of who we are. See, that's a lie from the enemy. Because the scripture clearly teaches there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who seek after God. All have sinned. All have turned away. And so that Paul is trying to bring home this idea, the idea that you could use the law and earn salvation is folly. It is not possible. Because if you mess up even just one part of the law, that's it. You're guilty of breaking all of it. And that's why he says the righteous will live by faith. See, our only hope is that it's Jesus See, Jesus is God himself who came as Emmanuel, God with us, lived a perfect life according to the law and the standard and the holiness of God. And he went to the cross on our behalf. We need a mediator between a holy, magnificent, glorious God and sinners. We need a mediator. And that is Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in Him, in Him, we might become the righteousness of God. Romans 1, 16 through 17 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Gentile. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Habakkuk 2.4. Look, his ego is inflated. He is without integrity. But the righteous one will live by his faith. See, we come to God not because we're naturally good, not because we are We deserve something from God, not because God owes us something. We come to him in faith with nothing falling before him. Praying for his grace and his mercy to fall upon us. That's why it says we are saved by grace through faith. We're not saved by works. We're not saved by good deeds. We're not saved by our abilities or our standing or what family we were born into. We are saved by grace. See, there's not a single man-centered method of salvation that could ever lead us to the throne of God in which we will be justified. And we see it all over the world. We see it all over our county. We see it all over our city, our neighborhoods. This idea that man is making his own way to God. I was reading some articles about surveys they've done recently with pastors and then evangelicals and then just with the population as a whole and there were questions about like well do you believe the bible is literal do you believe the bible's teachings are true you know do you believe you need church do you believe you need these things and that and it goes through all these biblical questions we do not live in a christian nation In the sense that we are the majority. We are the minority by a long, large margin. Everywhere you see, man is trying to work their way to God. You see it in Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness. You look at it and there's this idea that they have to earn, they have to do certain things, they have to accomplish certain things so that they will be good enough for God's grace. But we're clearly taught in Scripture that we cannot earn this. We cannot earn the grace of God. Picking up in verses 12 through 14 of Galatians 3. It 
It says, but the law is not based on faith. Instead, the one who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us because it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. The purpose was that the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles by Christ Jesus so that we, would, we could receive the promised spirit through faith. I think too often we gloss through some of these passages. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Romans 5, 8, But God proves His own love for us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. The atoning work of Christ cannot be understated in our lives. Even as believers, if you've been a, a believer and you've been following Christ for 20, 30, 40 years even, you need to go back and remember why the grace of God. That's why we are commanded to partake of the Lord's Supper to remember what Christ had accomplished. It's always important for us to remember the why. Why we were redeemed. Because it allows us to walk in humility. And see, at this moment, I think we'd be missing out just a little bit if we didn't spend some time on the doctrine of penal substitution. And I know doctrine sometimes, it's, it, doctrine is becoming one of those words that's kind of being removed from our church life. But the crazy part is the word doctrine or indoctrinate is all over the New Testament. Like you can't read a book of the Bible without finding teach sound doctrine. Even in the Great Commission, we, we read that verse of Matthew 28, right? Go, you know, go therefore into all the nations teaching. Well, that word teaching is indoctrinate them with everything that I have taught you. We need to understand some of our doctrine. And the idea of penal substitution is that penal means penalty. Substitution is in place of. There was a penalty to be paid for the sin, our sins. Christ was our substitute and paid that penalty for us. The penalty is the wages of sin is death. And I know many of y'all have probably either watched court cases on TV or, you know, you've been to one. You may have been even a juror before and you had to listen to the verdicts being brought out and being given out. And there's, there's penalties for actions that you commit. Well, the penalty for us being a sinner and committing one sin. Remember, if you break one part of the law, you're, you're guilty of breaking the whole of the law. So that penalty that is deserved is death. But praise be to God for verses like 1 Peter 2.24. He, that is Jesus himself, bore our sins in his body on the tree so that, having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. The gospel is built upon this idea that there's this penalty that needs to be paid and Christ became our substitute and took on that penalty for us. But in order for there to be a penalty, we have to talk about this word wrath. The wrath of God. The wrath of God is another one of those phrases and words that we've tried to remove from our Christianity. You know, you look at the best selling books in the Christian section, it's not. Let glorify God for his wrath. No, no, it's like love. God just loves you the way you are. Those are selling this idea of like glorify God for his wrath. It's not going to move the needle. And we don't like talking about this idea of wrath. 
But we are saved by grace through faith from the wrath of God. See, you're not saved from hell, a place. You're saved from a person, from God himself. Romans 5, 9, how much more then, since we have now been justified by his blood, we will be saved through him from wrath, his wrath. Ezekiel 7, 8 through 9, I will pour out my wrath on you very soon. I will exhaust my anger against you and judge you according to your ways. I will punish you for all your detestable practices. I will not look on you with pity or spare you. I will punish you for your ways and for your detestable practices within you. Then you will know that it is I, the Lord, who strikes. Yes, God is love. But God is not only love. God is wrath as well. And that is part of the gospel message. While we are sinners, we are under the wrath of God. And because we've moved this, removed this idea of wrath, we see that trickling out through a lot of our other beliefs. It's becoming very popular in American Christianity that there is no eternal hell. There is no eternal punishment. The idea of annihilation theory, that you either go with Christ or you cease to exist. And then this is branched off to all these other little beliefs. And we've seen this creep into the church, all these different beliefs about what hell and the lake of fire is. And it's like, well, it's Satan down there in charge. And he's, you know, torturing people and doing all these things. And you're like, no, the Bible doesn't teach any of that. The Bible teaches you're going to be cast into a place where you will experience the wrath of God. Hell is not the absence of God. Hell is the absence of experiencing the grace of God. The difference between those in heaven and those in hell right now is not that they're separated from God, but this group in heaven is experiencing the grace and the love of God. This group over here is experiencing the wrath and the hatred of God. Satan doesn't want to go to hell any more than any of us do. He will be experiencing the wrath of God as well. The fallen angels experiencing the wrath of God. Those who reject the gospel will be experiencing the wrath of God for all eternity. And those in Christ will be experiencing his grace and his love for all eternity. And his mercy. But in our quest to make man good, we've removed the wrath of God. We've removed a standard in which God has set forth. The standard is perfection. And we all fall short. But that's why it's by grace through faith. We cannot earn our salvation. We're even seeing people go as far to change lyrics and songs. To remove things. We can't sing about the wrath of God. We can't talk about the wrath of God. We can't even mention it. We can only mention that God is love all the time. And if we talk about God being wrath, then people won't come or people won't be a part or people won't buy in. But that's the reality of what God says. Jesus himself speaks a lot more about God's wrath than God's love. This is a big deal. The wrath of God is something that we have to know because if the wrath of God is true, then we definitely needed a substitute. We definitely needed someone to come in our place to pay that penalty because we cannot withstand the wrath of God. We cannot appease the wrath of God. Only Christ can do that. Colossians 2, 13-15. It says, And then you who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him. And forgave, you, gave, forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us. 
and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. In Christ, we have redemption. Isaiah 53, 6, we, were all, we all went astray like sheep. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. Because of the wrath of God, we need a Savior. We need someone who can save us from this wrath. But only God himself can save us from the wrath of God. Hence, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus. And it's interesting, the name Jesus, even. The name Jesus literally means the Lord saves. What's really interesting is that Jesus is the Greek pronunciation. His actual name, if he'd been walking around Israel, would have been Yeshua. Um, or we call it Joshua, but they didn't have a J sound in Hebrew. So they just said Yeshua. That would have been his name. Now, the neat thing about the Hebrew language is they kind of invert things. So they put the kind of the verb first and then the subject. So normally they would say, ran, I did. And be like, is this Yoda? What's going on here? That doesn't sound right. To us, it doesn't sound right. Ran, I did yesterday. You're going to be like, no, I ran yesterday. See, we put the subject first. But in Hebrew, they put, but they put the verb first, then the subject. But in the Hebrew language, when it wants to be emphatic, and it wants you to say, pay attention. This is extremely important. They put the subject first. And so in Jesus' name, it inverts it and literally says, the Lord saves. That's the idea of it. His name was emphatic. So every time they said his name, they were proclaiming boldly, the Lord saves. Not our good works, not our abilities, not our innate goodness. None of that saves us. It's the Lord who saves. And he saves us from the wrath of God, the penalty of our sin. So picking up in verses 15 through 18 of Galatians 3. He continues to say, Brothers and sisters, I'm not using, I am using a human illustration. No one sets aside or makes additions to validate human, to, to validated, I will get there. Hold on. No one sets aside or makes additions to a validated human will. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as though referring to many, but referring to one, and to your seed, who is Christ. My point is this. The law, which came 430 years later, did not invalidate a covenant previously established by God, and thus canceled the promise. For if the inheritance is based on the law, it is no longer based on the promise, but God has graciously given it to Abraham through the promise. The promised seed. If you remember when we went through Genesis, remember that first mention of the seed in, in early on in Genesis 3. And you see that mentioned again in the life of Abraham. And that seed was, was talking of Jesus. Matthew 1, 21, it says, She shall give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And then Jesus would come, and John 14, 6, we read, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We had a promise of the seed who would come and redeem us, who would save us from our sins. So you may be thinking, then what was the whole purpose of the law? Which we will get into that next week when we continue in Galatians. But basically the law was given us to show us the standard and show us that we desperately need a Savior. But it's always been by grace through faith. Even in the Old Testament, that's how the Old Testament saints were saved, by grace through faith. And today we are saved still by grace through faith. 
There is no salvation when you add works into the equation because it distorts and changes the gospel. See, that's what was happening in Galatia. They're like, yeah, 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 you need Jesus. You need to have faith in Jesus, but also you, you need this as well. Or also you need, you need to do this also. Anytime you add to the by grace through faith, you distort the gospel, and Scripture clearly teaches when you distort it, it becomes no gospel at all. So if you add to that message by grace through faith, and you add anything else into the equation, it is a false gospel, and it has no power to save. Zero. None. We do not bring anything to the table. We do not earn our salvation. We do not deserve salvation. Which is what makes it such good news. We do not carry a burden to be good enough for God. We do not carry a burden to earn and keep our salvation by grace through faith. It is a free gift. For the wages of sin is death, but... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Gift. It is something that we are given. It is not a payment for a job well done. It is a gift. And that's really important for us to remember. Because see, when you remember the why you're saved, it impacts the why you worship. Think about how much more your soul is going to cry out knowing that you have been redeemed and rescued from the wrath of God. Oh, praise His name. That's why we remember. That's why you must remember why you were saved and how you were saved. It's so important. Because you will get trapped into this idea of thinking, I gotta be good enough for God. I gotta do these things. I gotta do these things to earn God's blessings, to earn God's favor. But then we read things in like scripture in Ephesians 1 3, where it says that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In the gospel, in the good news of Jesus, in our salvation, we have been given everything that we, been, that we need. You don't have to carry a burden to be good enough to have a standing before a holy God. Christ has, has bore that burden for you. He went to the cross on your behalf so that you may be redeemed, so that you may be forgiven, so that you may enjoy God, so that you may know your heavenly Father, See, this is about a relationship. It's not about a location. It's not about a place. It's about a person. We must remember that. We don't show up here and sing to somehow earn blessings from God. We show up and sing because we have been redeemed. The penalty of our sin has been paid. That is why we sing. And that is why when you read in Scripture, we will be singing for all eternity. Hallelujah. Which is another great Hebrew word. It means praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we want to come to you in this moment. And we want to praise you and thank you that you have redeemed us. That you have forgiven us. And that in Christ we have been cleansed from all unrighteousness. And that the righteousness of Christ has been put on our account.
Father, you truly are worthy of worship and praise. And help us to remember it's by grace through faith that we just humbly come before you. Lord, if there's anyone here today who's trying to carry the burden of being good enough for you. Spirit, we ask that you just open their eyes to see your glory and your grace. To know that your burden is light and easy. Father, help us to be a people who love you, who worship you, And proclaim the good news to all people. Because we understand that your wrath is kindling and burning against the sinner. How dare we not be a people who go out and proclaim the gospel. Knowing that your wrath awaits them. Father, help us to be faithful. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time we are going to stand and we're going to sing and I'd encourage you. Look at the why. Why are you here? Ask yourself that. Seriously, why are you here? Are you here because family, because you're just supposed to, it's culturally acceptable? Or are you here because you have been redeemed and so you're here to praise His name? May that be our reason. Let's stand and let's sing.